Warning, 30 Screams or Less may contain spoilers about movies that have recently been released. If you haven't seen the movie, go watch it, come back, and enjoy the show. Or, if you don't want to waste your time watching the movie and rather have two random horror dudes watch it for you, we got you covered as well. Welcome everyone to 30 Screams or Less, a horror movie podcast where we review horror movies in 30 minutes or less. Continuing from last week, this time we're going to review Fear Street Part 2, 1978. It's directed by the same person, Lee Janik, written by Zach Ulkwitz. I'm going with that. Lee Janik and Phil Grazadil. I'm going with all that. Sounds I good probably, to me. I just butchered probably all those names. That's but fine. None of them are going to hear this anyways. Yeah, just go on IMDb. That's basically where I get all my information from. Just go there and you'll see the names. Starring Kiana Madreira uh, as Dina, Olivia Scott Welch as Samantha Frazier, Benjamin Flores Jr. as Josh, Sadie Sink as Ziggy, and Emily Rudd as Cindy Berman. Also, Ryan Simpkins as Alice, and McCabe Sly as Tommy Slater. I know, there's a whole bunch we're listing this time, but they're all kind of pivotal in this movie, so that's why I'm throwing them all in there. Plot is, Shady Side, 1978, school's out for the summer, and the activities at Camp Nightwing, cool name, are about to begin. But when another Shady Sider is possessed with the urge to kill, the fun in the sun becomes a gruesome fight for survival. 30 Screams or Less starts now. Corey, what did you think of part two? So I'm not going to lie, man. I was not really into this one as much as I was part one. Um, I didn't hate this by any means. I just, I don't know, kind of missed the mark for me. Really? And okay. I know, And I know part three is the one that gets shit on of this trilogy, but I haven't seen that one yet. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. And then uh-huh. what we'll do is we'll we'll average the three together and then be like, okay, this is this overall score. Like we're friggin' boxing judges or something. Perfect. Perfect. So uh I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good slasher flick. Uh there were way more kills in this one compared to the last one. I actually ended up counting them. So um yeah, there was a whole bunch, a whole bunch. And you know, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. The final number was Four kids and four counselors in this. So there was a lot of kills compared to the last time, which uh, there was really only a few, right? I I know. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't there wasn't that many. And it all it really all didn't happen until like the end of the movie. Right. So this one and you did mention that this movie kind of dragged on a little bit at first for you. But then when it kicked in, it was like zero to 60. Yeah. You get these evil fucking kids right in the beginning of the movie thinking Ziggy's a witch. Oh, I forgot to talk about. I love the opening with Dina and Josh showing up at um, the survivor's house. Yep. Yeah, I thought that's with Sam, who is still freaking the fuck out from the last movie. Oh, yeah. And the good thing this time is they actually got her out of the spiral phone cable (laughs) and they ended up wrapping her up with rope. Better choice, in my opinion, because rope does not move as easy as freaking spiral telephone cables. Come on. But yeah, that was our only gripe of the last one was the phone cable, like holding Samantha down. We're just thinking to ourselves, she can easily just break out of that. It's, yeah, it's I, love that. I love that, though, because from this part, we go back in time to 1978 on Camp Nightwing. Later on, we learn out who the survivor is like her true identity but right. um the start of this movie is kids being fucking evil and trying to burn ziggy to death with a lighter because they think she's a witch or fucking possessed s- she's possessed by sarah fear so they literally hold a lighter to this chick's bare skin sadists they're freaking nuts kids are brutal sometimes yeah I mean, I mean there's bullying and then there's attempted murder that's like kidnapping you know where she's getting tied up and they're trying to burn her alive that's insane. That's next level. Uh, but kids are crazy. They don't know sometimes. I mean, hell, when I went to junior high, they would put thumbtacks in their hands and just whack people in the back with them. What? <laughs> Where did you go to prison? Basically. Yeah, I went to public school. I did, too. And I never saw that. I just saw people get hit with belts, like like metal studded belts and shit. Oh, yeah. Ugh, yeah, we had that, too. We had all those like all that crazy stuff. 
I never saw the thumbtacks, though. No, I think that was a a short-lived one at my school, but I always found that to be psychotic. That's some Tommy Dreamer shit. Yeah, it's crazy. No wonder why I love ECW. Makes all the sense now. It makes so much sense why I like hardcore wrestling. So, okay, so now we've got these kids that are like sadists, friggin' nuts you know just like oh we're the sunny siders and you know they're fucking with ziggy ziggy's strung up they're trying to burn her all of a sudden the camp counselors come by naturally it's a sunny cider and he's like this is your last strike five strikes and you're out i'm thinking to myself that's a lot of strikes holy shit right what happened to only three what game is that what like what game are they playing it's fucking super mario where you get like as many lives as mushrooms ken griffey jr baseball did you see Ken Griffey Jr. is a photographer in the NFL now? Really? What an interesting gig. Yeah. He's a professional Good photographer. Him. Okay. Good for him. Wow. So he becomes like this famous baseball player, puts out a banger of a video game, retires, becomes a photographer. That's the life right there. Right? Yeah. I'll take that dream. Hell yeah. He was probably like, you know what? I'm a little bored. I think maybe I'll take up photography for the like NF. Oh my God. MB, MLB. Help me. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm just rifling through every single sport there. You're, yeah. you're, you got it eventually. It's fine. It's professional stickball, right? Yes. That's what it's called. Got it. So Ziggy, for some reason, she's in trouble by this whole thing. Uh, she goes to the nurse, Nurse Lane, which is like, I guess, her only friend at the time. And we find out that Nurse Lane is the mother of Ruby Lane. Now, Ruby Lane was the girl in the first one who was, quote, unquote, the hot one carrying around the old timey blade. You know, the old timey blade. blade is singing. Yeah, exactly. And so the mother is obviously kind of haunted by this whole thing. Her daughter's dead. She killed a bunch of people. And Ziki sees that there's a book on the table and it looks like it's Nurse Lane's, I guess, diary. And in this diary, it, she has all these drawings of the witch's markings and things like that. So Ziggy's asking about that. And then Nurse Lane becomes protective. She's trying to wrap up Ziggy's burn. And she's obviously tense and freaking out a little bit and hurting Ziggy. Ziggy's like, Nurse Lane. She's like, oh, oh, sorry. Got a little carried away type deal. Next scene, we cut to Cindy, which is Ziggy's sister. She's making out with this guy, Tommy. And like they're cleaning the bathroom at the same time. I don't know. That wouldn't do it for me, but to each their own, right? So they're like making out and they're cleaning and there's like this red moss that almost looks like blood, but it's just growing all over the place. So Cindy bumps into Ziggy and it's sister rivalry back and forth. They're always on each other. Cindy's trying to be more like a sunny cider and Ziggy's accepted her fate as a shady cider. And there's like this dynamic where they're just constantly at each other. Next scene. Corey, this is the one where Cindy's pissed off at her sister and her and Tommy are like washing the floor and we see the nurse walking, right? Nurse Lane. Do you remember what she says to Tommy and Cindy? I don't remember what she says, but I remember being really confused when she charged at Tommy with a knife. Yeah. Okay. So it was confusing at first, right? Right, right. But then we figure out, oh, that's why. We find out later on that Tommy, his name was on the carvings, whatever, where all the killer's names are carved in yep. at the witch's like altar or whatever that they find in that cabin. Exactly. Yeah. The witch's altar thing and all the killer's names are carved on the wall and Tavi's name was there and nurse lane just so happened to see his name there. So she's ready to just take him out ahead of time to prevent a whole thing from happening. And you know what? She's not wrong. She's pulling some Terminator shit. Good for her. Makes sense to do that just to stop the crime right in its tracks. But who knows? Maybe if Tommy was killed then that maybe someone else would take his place. Who knows? That part was awesome. It was just confusing at first. My note says, why did the nurse just try and knife Tommy? We had no clue why it was happening. It wasn't explained yet. Not yet. No. But we did see some references of names being carved into like a wall, whatever. And Fear Street Part 1. So there was a brief mention of it. So we were getting a little bit of background about what's happening. But now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty of it all. Now we're seeing like the actual uh, altar, cave, whatever you want to call it of the witch with all the names 
and the symbolism, all that shit. We're actually starting to see some of this imagery now. So the nurse and Tommy get into it. Tommy friggin' knocks the nurse out. I almost thought he broke her neck. And I was just going to be like, well, that sucks. Oh, sorry, nurse. Your daughter's dead. Now you're dead. So now Tommy's starting to get a case of the flies, right? So we start to see some flies kind of flying around him. He's not in that state yet. He's just hanging out in the cafeteria with all the other counselors and the, you know, the kids that are there. Cindy's friends are hanging out. One of them's rolling a joint and they're all getting ready for this color game, right? Yeah, I was going to say, we forgot to talk about the color game because there's a stupid jock, the guy that's like the leader of, is it the Sunnyvale? Yeah, it's Sunnyvale. So I keep calling it Sunnyside, but it's Sunnyvale. Thank you. This guy, just remember Trailer Park Boys. Sunnyville, got it. So this guy, I hated him. And I get it. I understand that's like the whole thing they were trying to portray because he's like a jock and he's like the leader of the football team kind of thing. But I wanted him to die so fucking bad. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So when he's trying to hype these kids up and like get the crews like against each other, the the Sunnyvilles and the sunny side, carry on my wayward son plays. And mm. dude, every time I hear that song now, I cannot not think of Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Because um, t- Tony Khan paid big bucks for the song, and now I hear it every week on Dynamite, and I my brain just makes that connection every single time I hear it, that Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks are going to come out and like super kick someone. Perfect. That's a good Which, way to remember it. I wish they did that during this scene. Super kick the jock in the fucking face. Can you imagine if Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks all just came out of nowhere and just super kicked this guy in the face? Someone <laughs> has to have a mashup somewhere. Right. If whoever, if someone hears this that has editing powers, please make this happen. I don't have those kind of editing powers. I have some, but that's like next level stuff. I can't do that. That's uh, I can't do that yet. Okay. But, well, you have homework. You have I to guess learn I how to homework. do that. Yeah. All right, I guess. All right, so this color game, uh, it's basically Sunnyvale versus Shady Side. Um, that's kind of their way of separating people. I don't, I don't think that's a way of separating people, but whatever. So they start off with it's like capture the flag almost, right? Like, but they are capturing teammates, they're locking them away into like a little makeshift prison. And Tommy's given the like a pep talk to the kids and you see he's starting to kind of go in and out of it and he's got a case of the flies. I'm just going to call it that now. They got a case of the flies. So I like it. You like it? All right, good. Yeah. We're going to go with it. So Tommy's got a case of the flies. You know, some flies are just going around him, whatever. He's just like, oh no, I'm fine. I'm okay. It's a Cindy. So Cindy's like, I need to figure out what happened to this nurse. They go to the nurse's station and she finds um, like a bottle of pills, right? And then Alice. So we met Alice and Arnie earlier in the film. They were actually uh, having a sex scene, which as we all know, is a clear indicator that both of them are going to die at some point. Yep. So very it's true. Like, it, it's movie law. It's Lasher law that if you have sex in these horror films, you're going to die. If you don't die while you're having sex, you're going to die at some point later on. Fuck it. I'll take that death. Why not? Yeah. Just stick a spear through me. Yeah. Just pray mantis me. I don't know what that means. Look it up. I don't want to. All right. I'll tell you. After the male praying mantis is done mating with the female praying mantis, the female bites the head off of the male and just I don't know, eats his head. Don't hamsters do that too? Oh, I don't know. I, I at least know that praying mantises do. Okay. So um, I, I'll go out that way. Sure. Why not? So Cindy finds these drugs. Alice and Arnie come in. Tommy's there. They're all like trying to figure out if nurse lane was crazy and they find the book and Alice is like, let's go in a, like, let's go in the woods. Let's look for this. So they all go in the woods and then they just randomly find a bunch of empty graves, which I thought was interesting. So apparently, and this is what I got out of it is that nurse lane was digging, trying to find the witch's hand. And yeah. That's like another thing that you really don't find out till later. And you're right. It makes sense now when you think back on it, like why she, like why that hole was there. Yeah, because she's just trying to find this shit because now she's trying to figure out like or find a way to really prove that her daughter wasn't crazy. She didn't have a psychological break. Nothing like that. It was the witch that caused this whole shit to happen. So they keep going. They actually somehow randomly just find the entrance to the witch's cave, I guess. You know, it's just right there. You know, no problem. You can easily just run into it. You know, you're just walking by like, oh, look at that. That's a rigging doorway to God knows what. 
Yeah, they just uh, they just found it. Wasn't it in a cabin in the basement in a cabin, or did I make that up? No, you made that up. Okay, I wanted it to be like Evil Dead. Yeah, I think we all did. So they go downstairs. Tommy still has a case of the flies. They make their way to this area, which, yes, it looks like an altar type deal. And uh, it has the witch's mark on the ground. And on the wall, they see the carvings. Uh, Tommy stayed outside, uh, you know, to keep watch for some reason. Arnie and Alice and Cindy, they're inside that little altar area. And they see a carving on the wall. They see that Tommy's name is in it. And so Arnie goes back. Arnie's like, you know, checking on Tommy. Tommy's just sitting there completely silent with his case of the flies. And then Arnie figures out that the pills that they found, that they were just taking there thinking that like they were going to get messed up on them. They were really just Tylenol. So next thing we see is Arnie turns around and Tommy takes an ax straight to Arnie's face. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dad, that, that was br- It was completely unexpected and so fucking gnarly. Just straight in the middle. I mean, no Tylenol in the world is ever going to cure that splitting headache. No, no, he's but, toast. He's done for. So he's he's dead, dead now. Uh, somehow the girls knock down like a wall and Tommy's behind the wall. They're safe for the moment. They thought Tommy was dead, but no, they can hear him breathing or whatever. So they're stuck down there. Tommy makes his way out of the witch's cave. And now he's able to just roam free with his axe and just take out whoever he wants. And the first person he takes out is this nerdy kid who was playing guard for three sunny veilers. Uh, that little kid, man. This is where the dead kid's counter just starts going up and up. Yep. Yep. So this poor kid is standing there like he got egged by the other sunny veilers <laughs> a little he, context here that kid must have been like seven years old yeah he was like a, a bigger kid wore glasses maybe seven eight i don't know he just he looked young and so all the kids escape he's cleaning off his glasses because he's got egg all over it he looks over and he's like tommy and tommy's got blood all over him he's got his axe and next thing you see is this kid is just getting gutted, basically. Tommy's just friggin' just destroying this kid with an axe. You don't see the actual act happen, but you see him fall down and Tommy's just hacking away. Yeah, you see you see Tommy swinging at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you at least see that. And then um, I think we're cutting back to this point where Cindy and Alice, they're in the caves trying to figure out their way out of there. Cindy's pissed off at Alice. Then they find out that Witch's Mark is actually a map. They can get out of that area based on that Witch's Mark map. So they make their way to this room. And it's, I think, right below the bathroom. They get to this room and there's like this fucking heart in the ground. It's, it was like a heart or something, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was. was. Like, it was like this giant ass heart. And Alice touches it bad move i think we already established you don't touch things that just don't make sense uh because of like in the tall grass you know they touch a, a just random rock in the middle of this friggin' cornfield and shit happened i think we've already established don't do that that's a bad idea if anything you probably should have destroyed it so alice touches it she goes crazy she's seeing all sorts of dead people uh you know they have no eyes cindy even looks dead and she ends up breaking her friggin leg always Always with the broken legs, Corey. This is a this is a gnarly broken leg too. That's one of them compound breaks where the bone was broken out. Oh god, I hate it. You it know what's just... funny? Like later on, I, I thought this part was fucking hilarious when she's trying to prove that she can walk on her leg. Like remember yeah. this? Oh yeah, dude. She the compound fracture. Like she tore everything in her leg. How is she walking? <laughs> no idea. No like, <laughs> movie magic. Movie magic. Her leg should just be jelly at this point. Because everything's fucked up. And she's like, nah, I'm going for a fucking stroll. No, she's like, I'm good. I have to see this through. I'll get to that. But uh, so, yeah, they're down in the caves and they realize that all of this red moss is around them, which means they're right below the bathroom. And at this point, Ziggy's actually getting into a fight with one of the other popular girls, actually the girl that burnt her in this bathroom because Ziggy decided she was going to play a joke on her. And this joke she played on this girl with the now Sheriff Good. Sheriff Good, uh, he worked there. He worked at Nightwing as a counselor. Ziggy was, you know, just a regular kid there. And I don't know, something started like, 
brewing up between the two, uh, a little bit of a relationship thing. So they have their moments. They decide they're going to play a trick on this popular girl. Bugs fall over her. Uh, at this point, Ziggy and a lot of the other campers, that's a word I wanted to use, are the campers. They're all back at the, uh, the rec hall trying to avoid this killer or just stay safe. And the counselors go out and they see, you know, carnage. They see like the, the nerdy kid dead, super dead. So Steve, when, when she dumps all those bugs on her bully, this is the second reference to Carrie that they made in this movie. Fuck, you're right. Yeah. I love that little subtle nods to like classic horror films. You know what? That's a good call. I love that they do that too. Um, Just recognizing the classics. It's always great that there's some sort of little throwback. Scream even does it. Yeah, Especially for sure. in where they're even, they're making all sorts of callbacks to like Nightmare on Elm Street and, you know, things like that. So, and where they're talking about, you know, sequels or requels or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I love when horror movies do that because it real recognizes real. Yeah. Okay. Ice Cube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Today was a good day. So where are we now? We are. Okay. Well, we, we didn't, we didn't get part back to when Tommy killed the first child. Oh yeah, let's get back to that. Let's get back to the part where Tommy killed the first kid. So yeah, he like literally kills four kids within the span of like thirty seconds in this movie. Like like young kids. Oh yeah, no, they're all campers. They are not even teens yet. Probably they're probably twelve and under at most. So yeah, Tommy kills that kid. They end up finding his body, or Sheriff Good finds his body, uh, and then there's like another slaughtering where Tommy entered a camp and there were four kids in there four from being in quote unquote jail, right? They're in jail during because they got captured, right? Because they got captured. Right, right. Tommy's in there. Uh, he just rolls in, hacks four of them to death. And so this is uh oh shit. It's five. It's not four. It's five. So five, uh, five kids. The numbers keep going up so, <laughs> yeah, just for kids. Yep, just for kids. So yeah, four kids dead there. We got the other kid that died earlier. Uh, and now we see that jock, you know, the jock that you were talking about earlier. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the one who sucked. How he, could I forget? How could I forget? Okay. Um, and then he's he's hooking up with the hippie chick, Shady Cider. And they finish doing their thing. No Prey Mantis style, whatever. Uh, he's just like, if you tell anyone, I'll fucking kill you. All right, dude, calm your tits. But anyways, <laughs> but... So he gets up, and as we know, if you have sex in a horror movie, or especially a slasher, you're dead. So he gets up, and he goes off, and we don't see him. But the hippie girl, she gets up, and she's, like, half naked, walking around. She hears a noise. It's Tommy. Tommy just takes an axe straight to the girl and dead. So we're at this point now where it's two camp counselors and four kids? Five kids, right? I think we're at five five yeah. kids. Yeah, so the numbers are adding up. Like, Tommy is putting in some serious work. So she's dead. Um, We still continue with Sheriff Goods finding the dead kids. And I don't even remember his name. The Sonny Valor, the one who's the jock. We'll just call him that. We'll just call him the jock because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because he sucks. He's the jock. So he comes out in a towel and he's just like, I found her dead. She was like... You know, she got an axe or whatever. And he's just saying it wasn't me. And Good's got blood all over his hands. And he's thinking that Sheriff Good or Nick Good is his name. Nick Good did it. But really, he just went into the building and saw all these kids slaughtered. And he got blood all over his hands because of Tommy. Tommy's uh, he's a mess. You know, he yeah. He doesn't clean up after himself. This part was cool, too, because it's the first time that Ziggy comes face to face with Tommy. Yeah. yeah. And because... Ziggy, we find out what how Tommy gets the burlap sack that he wears on his head in the first movie. Yeah, because I was wondering that for a little while. Like, when the hell does he get this sack? Also, why does he have it on the whole time? Like, in the couldn't... second? In the first yeah. one? No, in the second one. We'll get to it. Oh, yeah. What we didn't mention is that Nick Good, who is going to be Sheriff Good later on, he's part of a line of sheriffs you know for years and years and years his dad was a sheriff his dad was a sheriff things like that so it's like kind of a family thing but he's in there with ziggy like in one of those campsites i i don't know what to call them cabins cabins that's it he's in one of those cabins with ziggy and tommy comes in and he's looking for them they're trying to be quiet but however tommy is able to grab ziggy by the hair pulls her up 
Nick does his best to fight him off. He gets an axe to the leg, but it's still there. The leg is still intact. No compound fractures. It's not lopped off. It's just there. It's fine. Ziggy runs. Just slightly wounded. Just slightly wounded. Just a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound. So Ziggy's hiding. Carry on my wayward son is playing. Tommy walks by her and she's trying to get out. And she's like, use the song as kind of her cover. Just to, you know, she, she can quietly maybe stab Tommy. But music cuts out. Tommy turns around. However, Ziggy doesn't manage to get a knife into his chest. And they're struggling. She pulls like a sack of potatoes or something and puts a burlap sack over Tommy's head. This is now where he gets the sack. And for some reason, just continues to leave it on. I mean, I I don't hate it. It It, it looked fucking sweet. Friday the 13th to call back. Yeah, I love it. It's great. It looks fantastic, but I didn't see a need for it. It wasn't even tied down or anything. Jason Voorhees didn't have a need for a burlap sack. He didn't have a need for a hockey mask either. The hockey mask looks cool, though. Well, they both look cool. And he didn't get that till the third movie. No, he didn't. So, But they all look cool. So, yeah, they get away. Cindy is able to stab the shit out of Tommy as well and thinks that she's killed him. So Tommy's down on the ground. They think he's dead. There's a touching moment between two sisters where they're like, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. They're all apologizing. They're all whatever. So what we didn't mention, though, is that earlier, Alice said to Cindy, like, go ahead, try to escape, go save your sister. But Alice managed to find the witch's hand in that same area where all that moss was. So Alice gets the hand. She meets up with Cindy and Ziggy and shows that they have the hand and that they need to reunite the hand with the body. Right. So Alice is like with her compound fracture. She's fine, apparently. She can walk around. She's like, I have to go with you. I have to see this through. So she turns around. Here comes Tommy again with the axe to the chest. And Alice is dead. Like I said, if you have sex in a slasher film, you're fucking dead. You're going to die. Except the uh, the jock who somehow got on a bus and got the hell out of there with all those other kids. He survived, which just broke the law. Broke <laughs> slasher movie law. Broke the law. <laughs> slasher movie law out the window so that's the only time where he fucked up slasher movie law but same could be said with sydney in scream where she had sex with billy and she's fine maybe it's like at least one is fine but for the most part if you're having sex in the movie you got a bad chance you just you're gonna fucking die for the most part and most of the time you do most of the time you do so cindy fucking takes a shovel to tommy's throat Oh, I love this. Off. It's so cool. Cuts off his head. Just pure force. Head and the shovel and that's it. So what's happening though, below all of them, is that heart that we were talking about is growing shit? Growing people? Something like that? We see some sort of like shit happen where a blob comes off that heart and it's like forming a person. What we find out after she's just cut off the head of Tommy, they both hear singing. It's Ruby Lane coming out. Ruby Lane is singing in the background. And my subtitles, I saw that. I didn't even notice Ruby Lane at first. Uh, Did they ever explain why Ruby Lane sang? Yes, they did. Because Nurse Lane said she always wanted to be a singer. Oh, okay. I missed that. Yeah, that's when she was talking with Ziggy in the infirmary. Yeah, okay. So they were talking about that. But... We see her coming, uh, Cindy and Ziggy, they start running because at this point, Alice is toast. She's dead. But somehow Tommy, with no head whatsoever, is able to grab Cindy by the leg and like he doesn't need a head. You know, he's got his prey mantis head now. He's fucked. He's dead. Cindy took it. They didn't sleep together though. What the fuck? Robbed. Robbed. We got robbed. All right. So the two of them, they got the hand. They're just making a beeline for the tree where... The witch was hung. So they're trying to get over there. They have the hand. And we don't just see Ruby Lane. We now see Tommy with his new formed head and two other killers. One of the killers being the milkman and another being this kid who had a baseball bat and a mask. Those two are part of the uh, the killers that we saw in the first Fear Street. Is that when Josh was reading through all the killers, like the milkman, this and that two of those killers showed up as well. So So did they touch on these more in the third movie? Because I feel like they really only focus on three killers. 
No, they don't. They focus on pretty much Ruby Lane, Tommy, and Brian. Those are like pretty much the main three. Those other killers, they don't really talk about because in 1666 for Fear Street Part 3. Now with Fear Street Part 3, obviously that predates Milkmen and whatever that kid was. Where actually baseball wasn't even a thing then. So there was no need for a baseball bat. So hey, I wish they got more more screen time. Yeah, because they were weird looking. Uh, yeah, the especially mission, the kid with the baseball bat. Yeah, the kid with the baseball bat was fucking weird looking. Because, yeah, he had like this big giant ass mask on. Whereas the milkman, he looked like a regular milkman. But, yeah, I think it would have been cool to have them implemented a little bit more into the story. But I don't think they were pivotal characters. Ruby Lane was a pivotal character, though, because the mother, Nurse Lane, worked at Nightwing, where one of the other tragedies happened which is Tommy going ballistic, killing everyone. So the girls are getting killed at this point by all four killers. Cindy is getting an ax to the chest from Tommy, and Ziggy is getting stabbed over and over by the milkman. That was such a crazy scene, because I thought that they were both going to survive, you know, being sisters and all. Uh, nope, nope. Both of them got the shit murdered out of them. Yeah, they did. They both ended up real dead. So both sisters die, but here comes Nick Good, future Sheriff Good, coming for the save, able to bring Ziggy back to life somehow after she'd just been stabbed a whole shit ton of times. But because Ziggy was marked with the witch and she died, all the killers went away. This is similar to Samantha in Fear Street Part 1, where she died and all the killers went away because she was marked. So Ziggy survived the sister died and then we find out that ziggy's name is christine and christine is the person that dina and josh are listening to this story about so yeah that, so the she, survivor that they are they're talking to in the beginning of the movie ends up being an older version of ziggy exactly and she yeah. this is how they all find out that you know you die and the killers go you see the witch right is that what it is yeah. and then they bring you back to life yes exactly yeah, so, yeah, we find out the whole time that Ziggy is, in fact, uh, Christine, and she's the one telling this story the whole time. And, you know, what's messed up, too, though, at the end, Nick Good, future Sheriff Good, he said to the cops or sheriffs that, oh, Tommy just went nuts, and it wasn't a witch thing, even though Nick said he believed Ziggy and the witch thing. So, last minute, decides to be a heel says, fuck you, you know, I don't want to look crazy either, so uh, you can look crazy, I'll be fine, and I'll live my life like a normal human being, or like a Sonny Valor. So that's how it ends for the most part, um, but what we do end up finding out, or what we do see, because now we're back in the time frame of Fear Street Part 1, which is 1994, and Ziggy tells them exactly where the hand is buried. The hand is buried at the same exact tree that the witch was hung from. And that tree actually resides in the mall where Brian started killing all those people. I, I laughed so fucking hard when we find out that they essentially build a mall on top of a burial ground. Yeah, what the fuck? There should have been some sort of excavation happening, right? Where you're just like, oh, you know what? That looks like a dead body or a dead hand or something. You know, maybe <laughs> we should like call the cops before we build on it. Now, now just... They fucking just dropped them all right on top of that tree. And so these kids are digging like by this tree in the middle of the mall and they find the hand. So, yeah, I kind of cracked up when that happened. I'm not I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was funny. I'm thinking to myself the whole time it's in a mall. OK, sure. Why not? So they get the hand. They run it to where the witch is buried to reunite the body and the hand to hopefully rid shady side of this curse. Right. Just. So she touches the hand and the body, and it's all there. And Tina is transported somehow back to 1666. And it's basically point of view through the eyes of Sarah Fear. So now this is where we get to learn about how Sarah Fear, the witch, was hung and like and all that. So from what I saw in the trailer, though, it looks like a lot of the same characters that are in Fear Street 1 and 2 are also in 1666. I don't know if you saw that trailer. I'm sure you did. It was at the end of the movie. Yeah, I, I watched it. Yeah. Plus, you like spoilers anyways. Hell yeah. Yeah. Have so, you not seen the third one yet? 
I have seen the third one. Oh, I'm okay. waiting on you to see it. All right. But I'm going to have to watch it again because it's been a little while. I've seen the first two multiple times at this point. The third one, I just have not. I think it's because I like to watch these movies in succession. I don't yeah. like to kind of jump around. Even though I do know what's happening, if you were to just jump straight into 1666, you won't know what the fuck's happening at all. You'd be I like, wonder what would happen if you watched them from like 1666, 1994, and then 1978, or if switched 94 and 78 around. I don't know. Yeah, if you were to maybe watch it backwards or like, yeah, I don't know. It'd be an experiment because then you can really be like, wow, this is kind of messed up otherwise. But I think uh, to have it in that order, smarter because you have to go back. You have to keep going back and then eventually you'll be brought to the beginning. Okay, Corey, with that in mind, what do you give Fear Street Part 2 1978? Um, I'm going to give this one a four out of five dead kids. Um, okay. like I said before, I don't think it was as good as the first movie. I thought it dragged a little while for a little bit, at least. Um, eventually it does pick up and boy, it picks up a lot. Um, oh, yeah. it was great. Like, like you said, there was a ton of kills, brutal kills. And once again, man, I can't say enough about the score for this film. Like the first, actually I've heard them all at this point, but I haven't seen the third movie yet, but I love the, the score. For yeah, so much. They're they're perfect. The score is great. Uh, that's one thing I, we can definitely agree on. Uh, I didn't really see anything bad about this movie. Uh, I thought it was great. So I'm just going to give it a five out of five because like, I can't really think of anything that could justify taking it down a point. But I do agree that it does take a while for it to really kick into full gear. But then when it does, it's nonstop insanity. And sometimes the buildup like that is almost as important, if not more important than the insanity happening, because you have to build that tension to get to that craziness. So I like it for that aspect. Yeah. And I guess like it's, it's the middle of a story technically. So I, I, I can understand why it does feel like it drags because you're, you know, you're in the middle of a trilogy. Yeah. There's, it's a so. roller coaster, man. Like you have to have you build up and you come down a little bit and you like, you know, you experience it a little more and then you go up. 1666 and then you freaking drop down into insanity so i think it's kind of like a roller coaster ride i just saw your lap your emoji react to that photo yeah Corey sending me photos of uh the pretty girls from this movie yeah steve's in love with uh emily rudd yeah she's pretty she'll hear this and go i don't know he's in a metal band he has a horror podcast and eh, not for me i don't know who knows i'm a good looking dude that's all I got going for me. No, I, that's not true. I got a lot going for me. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to give it a five out of five. I loved it. But I could see where you think it's not as strong as the first one. It makes sense. Like, the whole thing is going to be wrapped up perfectly in a nice bow at the end. It's great. I can't wait for you to watch this, Corey. Watch 1666. Because, yeah, you might go, it's not as good. But it's just going to make so much sense to have them all together. I can't wait to shit all over it. I am sure you're going to shit all over it. You're going to be like a negative five. Negative five dead kids. Like five alive kids. Nope. No, I can't. I can't reverse my uh, my rating system now, no matter what how bad it gets. It? No, you have like your positive, right? Which are your dead kids, right? The positive is your dead kids. The negative is your alive kids. So okay. you're flipping things around. It's, it's math. It's math. All right. All right. I like it. That's, that's good. It's mean and medium. Well, I don't know. All right, everyone, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on Facebook, X, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on all podcast platforms so we can get some more exposure. And, of course, be sure to tell your friends. We're also a part of the Shining Wizards Network. Be sure to visit ShiningWizardsNetwork.com. They're an awesome podcast network ranging from wrestling to heavy metal and horror and so forth. So definitely check them out. Visit 30screamsofless.com for all previous episodes and transcripts that go with those episodes. And if there's anything you want us to review, send us an email to 30screamsorless at gmail.com or hit us up on social media. Use that hashtag 30screamsorless and we'll talk that way. Also, be sure to buy our merch. We have so much cool stuff that you should check out. Go to 30screamsofless.com. At the top, you'll see the shop link right there. We got shirts. We got mugs. Uh, what else? We got hoodies. hoodies. We have hoodies now, actually. Yeah, yeah, we have hoodies now. I figured out that problem. It was such a dumb problem. It just wasn't sinking properly. It kind of made me think that we were out of stock, like people bought them all, and that was awesome, but nah, it wasn't that at all. It was just a glitch. Yeah, it was just a glitch. Sorry about that, everyone. If you wanted to buy a hoodie and you couldn't before, it's available now. Buy a hoodie, buy a shirt, 
buy a, a coaster, buy a pint glass, just buy it all. Just buy it all. So that way we can pay our hosting fees. Yeah, buy one of everything. Just one of everything and we'll be set. We'll be good. So, all right, everyone. I'm Steve. And I'm Corey. And thanks for listening to 30 Screams of Less. And don't forget to drink your beans. Emily Rudd, will you be my wife? Steve Gushing. Yep, Steve Gushing. And then she's going to be like, who is he? She looks me up. Oh, God, what the fuck? Lawsuit. Sue this guy. Yep, exactly. All right, I think we can just get into it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, again. That's what Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> For real this time. All right.